Well, good morning. You know, you're not supposed to do that when you talk. You're supposed to just go into your talk, but I don't care. Good to see you. Happy stretchy pants day, Joe. Good to see everybody. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and uh, hopefully you uh, got some time with somebody, and if you didn't, today's the day. Take them out to lunch, and that'll be good, and you pretend it's something. Who ate something? Okay, I was going to say this right. Who did not have turkey? You had something else. Anybody in here? All right, all right. Some people, I saw some of my friends were having steak instead of turkey. They said, we don't like turkey. We're going to eat steak. I thought that was a sin. I didn't know you were allowed to do that. I got to write that down. <laughs> but anyway, we had three turkeys. Well, four if you count me. <laughs> anyway, that's a very 70s thing. So I'm going to show you the ugliest puppet you've ever seen. But it's the most valuable puppet to me. So uh, when I was in junior high, junior hires, <clears throat> how can I say this nicely? Junior, junior, high, junior high is a difficult time in life. And I enjoyed teaching junior high. I actually taught Danielle when she was in junior high. So she can tell you stories later about that. <laughs> Not really a ventriloquist or anything. But um, so when I was in junior high uh, with the youth group, I did puppets with the youth group. And uh, I still remember singing the coloring song, My Arm Hurts, whenever I hear that. Red is the color of the blood that flows on the road. It's a Petra song, and it goes on forever and has four billion words, and my arm hurts just thinking about it. But my grandmother found out that I was doing puppets, so she uh, uh, sewed and made a puppet for me. Now, it used to have eyes. It used to have a cowboy hat. I don't know where she got this hair. I hope it was not a wig of hers. I'm not sure. I always imagined it was because, you know, I was a kid. I didn't know. But she actually made me, I didn't even know you could make a puppet, but she did and gave it to me. And I'll never forget, even in junior high, now this will tell you how important it was, because junior high, typically, you're concerned about you. And you think everybody's looking at you, you think everybody, and, and the real discovery happens in high school when you finally realize nobody cares about you, which is a horrible thing to say, but you know what I mean. They're not looking at you, they're looking at themselves too. And so you're worried about your acne, but they're only noticing theirs primarily, except for the one mean kid who picks on everybody else. Uh, but that's another story for another day. I remember when she gave me this, how special it was to me, not because it was a puppet. It wasn't like I was home going, I wish someone would give me a puppet. I was a nerd, but I wasn't that level of nerd, right? Uh, uh, you know, it's not like I wanted a ukulele for Christmas. Uh, uh, now that would be cool, but back then. But anyway, so um, now, I, now, now bird feeders are in, you know. That's how nerdy. I've, I've gone to bird feeder age. But I remember getting it and thinking how special it was because not only did she think about what I would like, she went out of her way and put this thing together in love. And presented it to me in love. And today as we're looking at the end of 1 Timothy. And we're finishing up with the last couple of chapters. There's lots of different things I could have talked about uh, practically in this message. But I want to look at just a theme that kind of runs through this last couple of passages. And it's the idea of how we take care of others. Um, I think if you're going to evaluate where you're at in your Christian life, part of it, if you really wanted to look at it, would not just be, you know, am I doing, do I have this list? You know, we like to make a list. But, but it would be, how am I treating others? How am I taking care of others? How am I going out of my way to use my gifts for others? And today, I want to challenge you to do one thing. I want you this week... As we talk about this subject and we look at different ways, I want you to think about one way, in a concrete way, you can bless someone this week. That you can go out of your way to do something, use the gifts you have, use the talents you have, to be a blessing to someone else. Um, you know, God's given you words, He's given you gifts, He's given you things you know how to do. And the truth is, people 
as much as you made a big deal about whatever dessert or dinner you made, whether you, if it went well, you said, oh, that was great. Or if like me, you made bread and it was terrible and you, you threw them all away. That was my favorite thing. After Thanksgiving, I had spent hours making this bread and it came out horrible. And after Thanksgiving, I just went to the garbage can because nobody ate them and I just dumped it in the garbage can, and I thought, good riddance. Now, the good news is, next year, no one except for me will remember that I made horrible bread for Thanksgiving. But they will remember how I treated them. And the truth for you is, as important as you think that turkey was, or whatever you made, or whatever you ate, or whatever you did, the truth is, what really matters is, how are you making the people in your life feel? How are you treating them? Are you lifting them up or pushing them down? Are you always attacking them? Or are you looking for ways to encourage them? And so we're, we're going to look at three things that Paul talks about and, uh, to young Timothy as a young pastor, and we're going to kind of look at the practical side of these verses. There's a lot of directions I could have gone with these, uh, these two chapters, but this is the way we, we go today. All right, 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2 says this, oh, believers are treated lovingly like family. By the way, I had to put lovingly in there because originally I put believers are treated like family, but I've been a pastor long enough to know your families. And so I've seen people fight at funerals. I've seen people fight at weddings. It's very exciting. I've seen uh, uh, in-laws come to weddings drunk and make a scene. I've seen so many things. I was asked to wear a bulletproof vest to one wedding. How's that for experience? So uh, the policeman said, said, I would like you to wear a bulletproof vest, to which I said, is the bride wearing a bulletproof vest? To which he said, no. And I said, then I'm not wearing a bulletproof vest. Maybe the dumbest decision I ever made in my life, but there it is. Another wedding, I remember a drunk in-law coming in the back in the middle of the vows, and we could hear them coming in as people tried to stop them, and they were announcing their entrance in a very slurred manner. So all that to say that, I had to change point number one to say believers are treated lovingly like family, okay? And so, so regardless of how your family is, I want you to think of this idea of treating people lovingly. So Paul picks it up in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, and he says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly. Now, I love this word rebuke. It literally means to strike someone with words. Now, we've all had that. Many of you can remember something that was said to you when you were young. You, you remember that boss. You remember that parent. You remember that person in your life. Maybe that friend, person you thought was a friend. And you remember getting hit with words and getting hurt by words. Remember we used to say, words can never hurt me? You know that's a lie, right? <laughs> Sometimes I'd rather be hit, okay? So, not that that's a recommendation. That's not, Okay. So do not rebuke an older man harshly, and then it says, but exhort him. What's the idea of exhort? It's the idea of lifting somebody up. When's the last time you exhorted somebody? You helped to push them forward. Maybe they were stalled out. Maybe they were struggling at a time in life, and you looked to exhort them, to help them to move forward. As, he, as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers. Once again, this is lovingly, not, you know, I know. I know some of you. Older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters, and then I love this, with absolute purity. Have a good relationship with them. And then Paul goes on to talk to the early church and to Timothy about how one of the things when people are struggling is encourage them to go to their family first. And over the years, working with folks who are homeless or folks who show up at our church that are begging, we've actually given people bus tickets back to home so that they could get a restart and their family could take care of them. Now, we've also discovered over time that sometimes the reason that people are in the situation they're in is because they've burned every bridge, including with their family, right? And so we do that where we can. And Paul says, hey, when you treat people, look to treat them lovingly. If you have to rebuke them, you got to get on to them for something, how should you do it? You should exhort them. 
Look for ways to lift them up. How can I help you to make a change in your life when, I, when there's correction needed? How can I do it in a loving way? By the way, the Bible says when you're mature as Christians, or when we're mature, it says we'll speak the truth in love, right? Truth and love. And here's the deal. We tend to think love means just putting up with stuff so we never say anything, or we never say anything, we finally get really ticked off because we hadn't said anything, and that person keeps doing that thing, and we finally go truth on them without love, right? Like some of you did last night after the FSU Gators game. I saw your post. You people are evil. I'm glad I'm not a Gators fan today. Some of you, some of you need to repent this morning. I'm just kidding. But, but the truth is, I would much rather you joke about and have fun with teams than some of what you've had said to you. And so let's speak the truth in love. Let's help people by exhorting them, help them to do what they need to do. Listen to what it says here in Galatians. I love this. Let us not become weary. And this word for weary is a word that Jesus also uses about fainting. It's about the idea of getting tired. Where you, and in Florida, we totally get this. Like, we love, I don't know about you, I love working outside this time of year. I'm like, ooh, I'm not dying. This is great. But we've all had that moment when we're out in the yard in the middle of the summer, and all of a sudden we're like, oh, wait, wait a second. And the truth is, if you help people, if you do something good for people, if you go out of your way to bless people, if you're not careful, you'll feel like that. Oh, oh. So what do we do? Do not become weary in doing good. Why? Because at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. And I love that because I don't know about you, but you know, when you plant stuff in the yard, I am a killer of plants. I have a black thumb, right? I can kill anything. Literally, it, you give me a plant, it, it might be dead before we get home. I mean, it's amazing. I have a gift, right? But the truth is, when you plant something, you don't see immediate results. By the way, that includes if you do something dumb, like accidentally spray Roundup on your roses. I thought it was pesticide. It, I just... But then all of a sudden, what happens? You're like, it's dead. I don't know why it's dead. I just used some... Oh, no. <laughs> so the truth is, what happens? When you plant what's good, when you plant what's good, when you plant what's good, you're not going to see it right away. But if you keep going, it says this, we will... Reap a harvest if we do not give up. And then it says, therefore, as we have the opportunity. <clears throat> Don't we have opportunities? If you've got time to watch Netflix, you have the opportunity. If you've had time to see the most recent whatever, if you had time to pick up the games yesterday, if you got to see UCF crush the other team yesterday, then you've got opportunity. Sorry, just had to mention UCF, had to throw that in. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let's do good to all people. And then it says, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. Look for those opportunities. Number two. So not only believers are treating lovingly, number two, being content with what you have. Listen, if you don't hear anything else, if you need to take a nap, Mike, if you've had enough and it's nap time. By the way, somebody fell asleep in church last night right there, right there. It was really hard. I kept looking over and they were going, <sighs> and then I looked over again and they were, <laughs> and I thought, too much turkey, too much turkey. That's what does that. So, so, so here's the thing. If you need to fall asleep, fall asleep after this point, because to me, this is, this is kind of the, the biggest deal in these verses. Because the truth is, let, let me tell you what contentment's like. You guys had, had turkey, right? Some of you had steak. You ever been to a really good, how many of you have ever been to a really good steak place? You've been to a good steak place, right? And, okay, now, now don't lie to me. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're not going to want to raise your hand. But I want you to tell the truth. How many of you have ever been to McDonald's? Okay, thank you. I see those hands. You're forgiven. You are forgiven. Okay. All right. So, so, so you go to a steak restaurant, right? And you cut up that steak. And it, some of my mouth's watering just thinking about this, by the way. You cut up that steak and you eat it, and you eat it slowly, right? And you're like, mmm. Oh. And then whoever you're with, you have to describe what you're dealing with right there. You're like, this 
is like the best. And you're like taking your time, right? And you're just like, oh, oh unbelievable. And if you've been to McDonald's, and you're like me, you're driving down the road, you reach in the bag to eat the McDonald's, there's nothing in that bag. Why is there nothing? They must have forgotten, and then you look down, and there's french fry drippings, and you're like, I ate all of that, and I was so busy driving, I didn't even notice that I ate the McDonald's. I didn't even know. I forgot. I was, I was thinking, where are my French fries? Oh, I ate them all. And I was so busy just shoving food in my mouth and driving somewhere that I didn't even notice eating it. Now, I know none of you have ever done that because you're Christians and you love Jesus. But apparently, I'm a pig. And, and I have literally said, what did I eat for lunch? Now, at 2.30... I have sometimes said, did I eat lunch? Even when I ate lunch, did I eat lunch? That's sad. You know what contentment is? Too many of us go through life and we treat life like McDonald's. And we take it for granted. And we're so busy just getting from one place to the other, before we know it, we've consumed another day. Before we know it, we go, did I just go through today? Or maybe even worse, we went through the day complaining. Apparently, I've complained so much recently that one of my kids said, is my dad dying? Someday. Apparently, I'm complaining a lot. I didn't even know it. You ever complain and not know it? I'm tired of that. I'm tired of complaining, right? And so if we're not careful, we go through life like McDonald's. And can I encourage you, go through life like Ruth Chris's instead? Would you, would you stop a little bit? Would you just pay attention a little bit? Would you just notice a little bit? And don't get in such a hurry trying to survive the day. Listen, and I know some days are bad, and you're just like, I got to get through this. But even on the day that you have to get through it, Listen to what Paul says. I love this. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, here's what's really cool. This guy, Aristotle, you've probably heard of him. He, like, tutored this guy, Alexander the Great. He tutored some other guy named Plato, who I think made some kind of stuff that you put together. And Oh, wait, no, a different guy. But anyway, so... So Aristotle used to talk a lot about contentment, and he would say, to have a good life, you have to have contentment. You have to learn to be happy with what you have. That's what a real life is about. And I love that Paul, hundreds of years later, takes those, that same word that Aristotle used, and he adds to it, he says, godliness with contentment. Not just contentment, not just being happy with what you have, but recognizing that there is a God that has given you what you have. So take some time to dig in and don't McDonald's your life. And then he continues, is great gain. Why? For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content. And that's the word satisfied with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And here is one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Here it is. For the love of money is the root of all kind of evil. It does not say that money is evil. Money is neutral. Money doesn't have feelings. Money doesn't have emotions. But when you love money, and what's really cool is this word for love here is where we get the word filio, which means friendship, right? We know Philadelphia is the friendship city, right? And so this is the idea of you're going to be friends with your money. Money is not a faithful friend. The reason there's an eagle on your money is because it flies away, right? 
So it's not a good friend. And so when you're reaching for money, when you want money to be your best friend, when you look for that, you think that you're becoming this wonderful person who cares, but you're becoming Ebenezer Scrooge. The whole Scrooge thing is about somebody who fell in love with money and forgot about everybody else. And so Paul, early on, says the love of money is the root. It starts all kind of evil. And then he continues... Some people eager for money. And this word eagle, uh, eager is where we get the word for origami, which is really cool. It means to stretch. Some people are stretching so much for money that what happens? They've wandered from the face, faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. They were so busy reaching for money. It's like the scene at the end of Indiana Jones, right? Where the lady is reaching for the idol. And Indiana says, give me your hand, give me your hand. And she goes, no, I almost have. And then Indiana says, he's reaching for it, reaching for it. And he says, dad, I got it. And his dad looks at him. And he says, Indy, let it go. Which is crazy because David told me last night that that lady's name was Elsa. So that's really weird. But anyway, <laughs> right? Let it go. Okay, but here's the deal. If you're pursuing money and you want that to be your friend, if you're not careful, you will forget about everything else and you will what? Pierce yourself with many griefs. You'll have tons of regrets. You, you will McDonald's your life and you'll wonder where the time went and you'll wonder why you don't have a good relationship with your children or your friends or your neighbors, why you haven't gone out of your way to get to know people. And so when the ghost of Christmas past shows up, you say, oh, I missed a lot. They've wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, I thought I was a pretty content person. I tend to think that I'm a, a steak eater when it comes to life, and I'm not a McDonald's eater, until I saw the progressive commercials, which say, you're becoming your parents. And every time I watch one, I go, oh, oh, I go, oh, yeah. So there's one that comes on, and it's showing them go to a concert, and they park out at the edge of the field. And the guy says, as he gets out of the van, he says, you know, you're really good to park here, because that way we can leave faster. And the guy says, don't, you're not supposed to focus on leaving yet. And I went, oh, no. Because I go to concerts, I go and, and, and see king and country, and I'm sitting in the concert, and I'm looking behind me going, how quick can we get out of here? When I'm driving in, I'm figuring out where to park and back in so that I can force my children to run to the car, and they better not have to go to the bathroom. They have to go to the bathroom. They can take an Uber home because I'll be home before they get out of the bathroom, right? And so, so I watch that commercial and I think, I think I'm enjoying the concert. But the truth is, I'm already going, how do I get out of here? If you're not careful as you go through life, you'll do that with every single part of your life. When you're young, you wish you were older. When you're older, you wish you were younger. When your kids are growing up, you'll think, well, we just got to make it through this stage. Hey, enjoy that horrible, awkward stage. I mean, you could still pray, oh, Jesus, you got to help me through this one. But the truth is, every stage is important. The stages you don't like are still steak. Don't McDonald's them. Don't McDonald's them. And the truth is, these, these different stages come in life. Are you going to be content because here's what I know about contentment. When I'm looking to get out, when I'm looking for what's next, when I'm reaching for money, I can't love the people that are near me. I can't care about the people that are near me because I'm too busy thinking about the next thing. Now listen, if you're a leader, that's part of who you are. We're going to be, next month I'm going to be, I mean in January I'm going to be doing a series on Nehemiah and talking about leadership. And one of the things about leaders is they're always thinking about what's next. But don't be so busy thinking about what's next that you don't enjoy the now. Paul says this, Philippians 4.12, I know what it's like to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. 
in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. Now, the big thing for psychologists now is called mindfulness. And that's the idea of being present where you're at. But I, I want to add one thing to that, okay? And by the way, if you don't know what mindfulness is, it's just basically realizing that you're here. Because your brain sometimes is somewhere else. So you have to redirect it, take a couple deep breaths, maybe close your eyes. That's mindfulness. But, but let me add something to that that makes it better. Be mindful that God is with you. And so when you take time to take that breath and go, Lord, thank you that I'm breathing. Lord, thank you that you're going to help me through this. Lord, thank you for my teenager. I got to pray that one again. Lord, thank you for my teenager. Got up this morning, went down to get coffee. My OCD daughter is home. My coffee is gone. It has been put away. Lord Jesus, thank you for a sweet, wonderful daughter. Where's my coffee? You're going to have those moments in life that you don't like what's going on or what's happening. And those are moments to be mindful. To realize that you got... When is fast, fast enough? Remember when the speed limit was 55? And 70 seemed like, woohoo! If you go 70 now on I-95, you're going to die. You might as well drive backwards. People just run you over. But when it was 55, if you drove 70, they were like, maniac! What happens if they change it again? It's never enough for us. What's enough? A little bit more. So I want to encourage you. Don't wait for a little bit more. Be content. Be mindful. Be where you are. By the way, they've also discovered when you're super stressed out, mindfulness is awesome. But mindfulness and thankfulness are even better. God, thank you. Lord, I know I'm walking through this hard thing. Thank you for who you've made me. Favorite Christmas movie this time of year, Die Hard. Right? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take your shoes off and make fists on the floor. Worst advice ever. But the truth is, it's very practical to just pay attention. To just take a moment and wiggle your toes and thank God for toes. Take a moment and wiggle your fingers and thank God for fingers. I jammed one of my fingers this week. I have noticed it every time. Mindfulness. God, thank you. Number three. Blessing others and hoping in God. Now, you're going to really have to use your imagination for this. Because I didn't have any Skittles. But somehow the church was unable to give away enough candy corn that we don't have two giant... If you love candy corn... We can give you a lifetime supply. <laughs> so you'll have to pretend these are Skittles. I heard a pastor do this years ago, and it really made an made a impression on me. So I want to make an impression on you. He said he went and got his son for his birthday. His son loves Skittles, so he got him that big bag of Skittles. And he gave it to his teenage son. And he looked over, and his son had ripped the bag open. He's looking at his son, and his son's got the, the blue juice running out of the corner of his mouth. And the dad goes, oh, I like Skittles too. And he goes, son, can I have a few Skittles? And the kid goes, no, these are my Skittles. And the dad said, I had a choice right then. I could have just grabbed the Skittles from him. You think they're yours? Whack him with the bag, right? He said, but I realized very quickly, that's the same thing we do to God. God's given us all kind of gifts, all kind of talents, given us finances. And then he says, I want you to give part of that back to me. And we say, no, mine. If you want to overcome greed, if you want to overcome selfishness, if you want to overcome the, the discontentment that you have all the time, one of the keys is, Give away some of what God's given you. 
Go out of your way to give. Go out of your way to bless others. Go out of your way to tithe. If you don't know about tithing, maybe read some Dave Ramsey articles. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God who richly provides us, I love this, with everything for our enjoyment. Do you realize God has given you all kind of things for enjoyment? It's not wrong to enjoy what you've been given. When you go home and the air conditioner kicks on, you should say, thank you, Jesus. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, willing to share. Give your Skittles away, it says. In this way, they'll lay up for themselves a firm foundation, a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Why? So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. In 2 Corinthians, it says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. I love this. Not reluctantly. Ah, I'm not giving. Or under compulsion. Well, I guess they made me feel bad, so I'm going to give. Don't give for either of those reasons. For God loves a cheerful, and that word literally means hilarious giver. Which... You know, that would be weird if we all started laughing like we're crazy in church. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you'll abound in every good work. So I want to give you a 28-year-old story that just happened to me about three weeks ago. One of my college students from 28 years ago came to visit me. He had gone to Florida Tech and he was in my college ministry. But he did not come to visit me first. <gasps> first, he went to his adopted family. Because when I was the college pastor, I remembered that this family called the Lineses, who were here in church just a few weeks ago, used to invite me over to lunch when I was in college. And lunch to a college student who's been eating cereal and salad was amazing. And I have never forgotten that. And so I said, when we do college ministry, I want some of our families to adopt college students from next door. And you will promise to feed them at least once a month. If you want to do more than that, you can. And so this one family, the Cobbs, took home kids and they would let them wash clothes at their house. And they would feed them and they would take them places and they would take them out to eat and they would spend time with them. And before Andrew came to visit me, I'm the pastor guy. Before he came to visit me, he went to Melbourne to visit with his adopted family who cared about him and used their gifts to bless him. Listen, if you go out of your way to bless others, you may never see it. You may never get a thank you. You may never get a visit. But God notices when you take what he's given you and you pour that blessing out on someone else. And the Bible says that when you bless others, you will reap what you sow. You are storing up in heaven. Even if you never see it on this earth. Even if somebody never comes and visits you 28 years later to say thank you. God notices. And so I want to encourage you. Take care of others. Be content with what God has given you. But don't just be content with what he's given you. Take it and say, okay, now how can I bless someone else? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to him. Knowing we're all sinners, that's not a big stretch for any of us. Some of us feel like professional sinners. Knowing that we're sinners and we need the grace of God. And that's why Jesus died on a cross for us. So if you're here today and you want to give your life to him and say, God, I'm surrendering my life to you. I surrender my sin, my way of doing things, my selfishness to you. And I receive your gift of eternal life. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you about that after the service. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, as I talked, you thought of the one thing that you're supposed to do. Maybe the person you're supposed to share with. Maybe the thing you're supposed to go out of the way. The gift that you have that you're supposed to give away this week to someone else. I pray that this week you would do that. 
Just be faithful with what God's given you. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for this time together. I thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you for all the people in our service, in our church that use their gifts, not just to bless people here, but to bless people at work, to bless their neighbors, to bless their friends, to to bless their community. Father, thank you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to give us strength and not that we would not grow weary, not grow faint in doing good, but we would continue to do what you've called us to do. Lord, I pray as we give financially today that we could just give back part of what you've given to us and be grateful. Thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.